In today's video, we're going to look at counting alternating permutations, and it's going to use mathematics that we just would not expect to see in a problem like this. So an alternating permutation is a permutation of the set 1 through n that goes up, then down, then up, then down, then up, etc. So for example, for the numbers 1 through 4, this is a list of the five alternating permutations. Like this one, we have 1, then 3, then 2, then 4. And here we have 3, then 4, then 1, then 2. So our question is, how many of these are there? We're going to use generating series to analyze this question. And the answer is going to take us to some really interesting math that I promise you is stuff that you would not expect to come out of this. So stay tuned for this interesting investigation of alternating permutations. So to start off, a typical way to approach a problem like this is to decompose the permutations you're working with into pieces. So what we can do is look at where the largest number appears in an alternating sequence. So here, for example, we have a 4 in these different spots. Now notice, because the number 4 has to be larger than the numbers beside it, the number 4 doesn't appear in any spot that she wants. So for example, in an alternating permutation, 4, which is the largest number, can't appear in the third position because it's not less than any of the numbers in the list. So if we try to do an analysis where we say pick the largest number and then break this up into two smaller permutations and analyze, you won't be able to pick that 4 to be in any of the positions because some positions won't be allowed. So what we're going to do is add in what we call reverse alternating permutations. So they go down, up, down, up, down, up. So I'm going to write some of them right over here. So I've written down in red here the five different reverse alternating permutations. Now you notice there is an actual bijection or one-to-one -one correspondence between alternating and reverse alternating permutations. And I've sort of wrote these down in a way that you can see it, where you replace any number by in general, n plus 1 minus that number. So here, we'll replace every number by 5 minus that number. And that flips any of the relations that we had before, right? If this is less than this, then 5 minus this is greater than 5 minus this. Okay, so if we let a sub n be the number of alternating permutations, and then write down b sub n to be the number of reverse alternating permutations. So here we do notice that the fours appear in the first spot or the third spot. So altogether the fours can appear anywhere when we take into consideration both alternating and reverse alternating permutations. Moreover, because of the bijection, one-to-one -one correspondence we talked about earlier, this number here of alternating permutations is the same as the number of reverse alternating permutations. So what we'll do to help us get toward our first goal, which is a recurrence relation for these a sub n's, is we're going to take a general alternating permutation or reverse alternating permutation and decompose it into pieces that are going to be alternating or reverse alternating. Together with the fact that we know that these counts are the same, we can use that to develop something like this. So let's go ahead and dive into that. So let's imagine we clump together all alternating permutations and all reverse alternating permutations together. So then this largest element, I'm going to take the permutations of these types for, on the set 1 through n plus 1. This largest element is going to lie somewhere here and all possible positions are possible because we're either alternating or reverse alternating. So wherever this n plus 1 is, we're going to have a less than before it, a greater than before it, so at the beginning, we'll end up with either a less than or greater than, which will give us either one of the types. All right, so if we put in an n plus 1 in some random position here, there are a lot of different positions where this n plus 1 can go. Okay, let's say this is position k, and so this is position k plus 2. We need to fill in these things somehow, and here we're going to have an alternating or reverse alternating permutation, and here we're going to have a similar thing. So we have to fill in the slots with the symbols 1 through n. Now there's n choose k ways to pick the elements that we select from here that go on this left-hand side. These k elements are going to have a relative order with respect to themselves. So what we can do is relabel the numbers that we choose as 1 hat, 2 hat, 
3 hat up to k hat, where 1 hat is the smallest element we chose, 2 hat is the next smallest, etc. Okay, so if we think about this that way, then we're filling in these numbers in these slots. So we're going to get, depending on where this n plus 1 is, either n choose k times the number of reverse alternating permutations or the number of alternating permutations. But since both of these are actually equal, we can say that the number of ways to fill this in is going to be n choose k times the number of alternating permutations on k elements. Now, the elements that we choose to fill in this slot are actually fixed. They're all the ones we didn't choose for this slot. So the number of these is going to be the number of alternating or the number of reverse alternating permutations depending on which way the orientation of the inequalities go and since here we have n minus these k this will be a sub n minus k or b sub n minus k but these counts are equal okay so in total since whatever we do here is independent of what we do here in terms of picking the ordering in which the numbers are entered, the total number of ways to fill in these slots is the product of these two things. And now k itself runs from 0, because n plus 1 could be in this spot, all the way to when n plus 1 is here, which was when k is n. So we get that when we place all alternating and reverse alternating permutations into one big bin, the total number is the sum of the product of these two over all values of k that go from 0 to n. And that's precisely this quantity right over here. OK, but the total number of alternating permutations together with reverse alternating permutations, that's what we counted here, is the combination of both of them, is on n plus 1 elements, a n plus 1 plus b n plus 1. But since these two quantities were actually equal, as we mentioned earlier, this is twice the number of alternating permutations on n plus 1 elements, which is this thing right over here. So through this analysis where we pick the largest element, we actually get this recurrence equation right over here. So before continuing, I want to mention, when you have labeled structures like this, these types of decompositions where you consider the largest element are actually quite common in combinatorics type problems. So something to consider if you have a problem in the future of this flavor. All right, so now that we have this, let's go ahead and try to figure out a closed form for the series right over here. Now you might think, why bother with a series that looks like this, where we have this j factorial here? The motivation for considering a shift from ajx to the j, which is what we'd normally do in generating series, to ajx to the j over j factorial is because when we expand n choose k, we're going to get a k factorial and an n minus k factorial in the denominator. And we can match those with a k and a sub n minus k. So this is a nice uniform way to look at this expression here. So let's go ahead and get this closed form for a of x, which I promise you is going to have a really surprising treat when we look at it. Starting with our recurrence, I want to analyze this quantity here. So this is n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. So I want to rewrite this as saying for n greater than or equal to 1, we have 2a sub n plus 1 over n factorial by dividing by this n factorial is the sum k equals 0 to n of a k factor over k factorial, a n minus k over n minus k factorial. That was kind of the motivation for having this expression for the generating series instead of having our normal generating series aj x to the k. This, by the way, is called an exponential generating series for the sequence a sub j. So if you want to look up things of this nature after this video, I would suggest typing in exponential generating function wherever you search for things. Okay, so now we want to know a closed form for this expression right over here. And we notice that we have like pieces of this in each of these parts. We have this, we have this, but this one is like slightly off. That's okay, we'll be able to manage that. Now here, if you look at the right side, we're taking the x to the k coefficient and multiplying it by the x to the n minus k coefficient and doing that for all k. When we do that, that's like multiplying this series by itself. 
Because when we multiply this by itself, to get the x to the nth coefficient, we need to take like an x to the k coefficient in one copy, and x to the n minus k coefficient in another copy, multiply, and do that for all possible k. So that suggests to us that we should square this series. Okay, so the square is the square of this thing, which I'll write as two copies so that we just have a picture of our head in our head of how this goes. I'll write j prime as the index of the other series. All right, so we multiply term by term. Now this recurrence only works for n greater than or equal to one. So I'm gonna pull out the first term here, which is a one. And then we're gonna get the sum, n equals one to infinity of precisely this kind of expression. Because we want the x to nth coefficient, we do like we said, pair these up. So we get the sum k equals zero to n a k over k factorial a n minus k over n minus k factorial x to the k. And now by recurrence we can make a substitution here. This is 1 plus the sum n equals 1 to infinity of this quantity here. 2 a sub n plus 1 we still have this should be x to the n over n factorial x to the n. All right, let's explicitly write this out. So this is one plus twice a sub two over one factorial times x plus two a sub three x squared over two factorial plus two a sub four x cubed over three factorial, etc. So this looks actually quite close to our series. It's a little bit off. We have a one plus two times a two x plus a three x squared over two factorial plus a four x cubed over three factorial, etc. So this is a series that we have here, but it's a little bit off. It's missing some of the terms, and also the exponents are off from the indices. But if you notice, when you take this series and differentiate it, you actually get almost what you have right over here. For example, if you took the term a4 x to the 4 over 4 factorial in this series and differentiate, you'd get 4 a4 x cubed over 4 factorial, and the 4 and the 4 factorial would make a 3 factorial in the denominator. So you'd actually get this term right over here. So this is actually the derivative of a of x, but it's missing one term. It's missing that a1 term. So we can rewrite this whole thing here as a prime of x minus one. It's actually minus a one, but a one itself is one. And so now you see that we've represented the square of our function in terms of its derivative. So we actually have a differential equation for a of x. So through this computation, our differential equation says that a squared x is one, plus twice the quantity a of x minus one. And we also have the initial condition that because our first coefficient is a one, that a of zero is one. So now our process is gonna to be to actually solve this differential equation to figure out the closed form of a of x. And then whatever the Taylor series expansion of that is, its coefficients are gonna actually tell us the number of alternating permutations on the numbers one through n. So let's go ahead and rearrange to solve this differential equation. First, we can re-represent it as a squared x equals, because we have this one and the minus two, twice a prime of x minus one. Now integrating, we get one half x plus some constant is the integral of this. One over one plus y squared has an integral of arctan. So this is arctan a of x. And so as a consequence, a of x is a shift of tangent, this tangent of one half x plus c. But we also have the condition that a of zero is one. So a of zero is one, but a of zero is the tangent of c. So that means we can make c to be pi over four. And so we get our closed form for a of x. a of x itself is the tangent of one half x plus pi over four. Okay, this is actually remarkable. 
What this means is that if we go to a calculator and actually expand the Taylor series of tangent, we get as its coefficients multiplied by j factorial, the number of alternating permutations on j elements. Okay, so before continuing, I want to actually take a little bit of a trigonometric aside because this is going to illuminate something actually quite interesting. So you notice that this can be represented as a half times x plus pi over 2. So I'm going to look carefully at tangent of a half of an angle. This is sine of half that angle over cosine of half that angle. Okay, now here we can use a double angle formula that lets us write cosine in terms of this expression. And we can do the same thing here with the denominator. So if we rearrange, the ratio of the squares of these is 1 minus cos theta over 1 plus cos theta. So this thing is the square root of 1 minus cos theta over 1 plus cos theta. Now, if we multiply by 1 minus cos theta over 1 minus cos theta inside of the square root, we get the square root of the quantity 1 minus cos theta squared all over 1 minus cos squared theta, which is sine squared theta. So we can represent this as 1 minus cos theta over sine theta. So that tells us that tangent of a half theta is actually cosecant theta minus cotangent theta. So let's use that to change the expression that we have for this thing. So a of x is the tangent of a half x plus pi over 2. And that's going to be now cosecant of x plus pi over 2 minus cotangent of x plus pi over 2. And by trig identities, this is secant x plus tangent x. So another way to represent our series is to actually write it as secant x plus tangent x. So this is actually really amazing. If you go to Wolfram Alpha and actually type in secant x plus tangent x, ask for the series expansion and actually get it to spit it out, you'll actually get as the coefficient of x to the n the number of alternating permutations on 1 through n divided by n factorial. So for example, if we take a look here, we see that the coefficient of x to the 4, we have this 5 in front, and we saw at the beginning of the video the number of alternating permutations on 4 elements was 5. And here we can extrapolate that the number of alternating permutations on 5 elements, for example, is 16. 6 elements is 61. So this is a kind of a really cool, cool phenomenon. Now it turns out if you expanded these two series on their own, this one only sees even exponents of x, and this one only sees odd exponents of x. So sometimes when we look at alternating permutations on the set of numbers between 1 and n, where n is even, they're called the secant numbers. And when you do odds, they're sometimes called the tangent numbers because of this phenomenon. So a really cool revelation that we see through generating series that allows us to start with a recurrence relation, get a differential equation for a generating series, and then consequently figure out what our coefficients are in terms of power series of functions that we actually know and love from calculus. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, click the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel.